नमो तस्त भगवत अर्हतो सम्मत नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत समृत नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत समृत Hey, today uh, I'm going to read a sutta called Sangharva of a Sutta. I'll share my screen so that everybody be, will be able to follow. Okay. Uh, do you want me to share the link, or you can follow it here? Okay. It Savati. Then the Brahmin. Sangharava approached the blessed one and exchanged greetings with him. When they had concluded their greetings and cordial talk, he sat down to one side and said to the blessed one, Master Gautama, what is the cause and reason? Why sometimes even those hints that have been recited over a long period do not recur to the mind, let alone those that have not been recited. What is the cause and reason? Why sometimes those hints that have not been recited over a long period recur to the mind, let alone those that have been recited? So as every sukta starts, uh, there is a person named Sangharava. He has come to the blessed one, to the Buddha, and he paid homage to the blessed one. And he's asking a question, like, why there is sometimes we can remember easily and sometimes we do not remember easily. And the word hints is uh, normally in English, in Hindi here in India, it's called bhajan or uh, spiritual poems that are being like recited, repeated at the spiritual gathering. And uh, sometimes we can remember easily, sometimes it's not, even if we recite, we did not, we cannot remember. Sometimes without even recitation, we remember easily. And he's asking why, what is the cause and what is the reason he's asking to the Buddha. So now the Buddha answers, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind obsessed by sensual lust, overwhelmed by sensual lust, and one does not understand as it really is, the escape from arising sensual lust, on that occasion, one neither knows nor sees as it really is, one's own good or the good of others or the good of both. Then, even those hints that have been recited over a long period do not recur to the mind, let alone those that have not been recited. Okay, uh, here Buddha is saying, when the mind has been obsessed by sensual lust and has engaged in sensual lust, then they do not know and understand the escape from the arising sensual lust. On that occasion, then when there is the mind is like hijacked or in sensual lust, then they cannot know what is good for them, good for others or good for both. And then in that, when the mind is involved in that sensual lust, then they cannot remember what has been recited over a period, then let alone those that have not been recited. Uh, in this sutta, the uh, Buddha gives stimulus for each kind of hindrance that we are going to experience. We'll read. Suppose, Brahmin, there is a bowl of water mixed with lac, turmeric, blue dye, or crimson dye. If a man with good sight were to examine his own facial expression in it, he would neither know 
nor see. See it as it really is. So too, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind obsessed by sensual lust, overwhelmed by sensual lust, and one does not understand as it really is, the escape from the sensual lust, on that occasion, even those hymns that have been recited over a long period do not recur to the mind, let alone those that have not been recited. So here the simile is, uh, there is a bowl of water uh, in which there is, it is mixed with turmeric or a blue dye or a dark red colored dye. And if a person with good eyesight sees his reflection, he will not be able to see because the water has been mixed with the dye. The dye is being given, given as a simile for the sensual lust. When our mind is obsessed with sensual lust, or if the mind is engaged in sensual lust, sensual desire, then we cannot know our own reflection, what we are doing. We, it directly states we are not mindful enough. Then we do not, we cannot remember what was recited over a long period and let alone those that we have not been recited. Again, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind obsessed by ill will, overwhelmed by ill will, and one does not understand as it really is, the escape from arising ill will, on that occasion, one neither knows nor sees. It nor sees as it really is, one's own good or the good of others or the good of both. Then even those hymns that have been recited over a long period do not recur to the mind, let alone those that have not been recited. So this is the second hindrance that comes up in the hindrances, that is the ill will. So when the mind is engaged in ill will, one does not know what is the escape from it, how to do six hours or they don't have like want to let it go but when there is the mindfulness then they can but here when the mind is engaged in ill will having like in the proliferation then they don't know the good that what's good for them or what's good for the others or what's good for both of them then in that case they cannot remember what has been recited over a long period and let alone those that have not been recited. Even for us, when, our, when we are in our daily activities, when we are practicing active meditation, sometimes we do not remember to six hours. Even though we have been practicing, our mind would have gone into hindrances. Suppose, Brahmin, there is a bowl of water being heated over a fire, bubbling and boiling. If a man with good sight were to examine his own facial reflection in it, he would neither know nor see it as it really is. So too, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind obsessed by ill will, and one does not understand as it really is, the escape from the arising ill will. On that occasion, even those hymns that have been recited over a long period do not recur to the mind, let alone those that have not been recited. So the simile here is the same, uh, like a bowl of water, which is boiling, which is heating over the fire. Then when a man with a good sight, when he tries to examine his own facial reflection, then because the water is boiling, he cannot able to see what's good, what is good for others. He cannot see his own reflection. The boiling of the water is given for, as a symbol for the ill will of our mind. In that case, then he do not know, he cannot remember what has been recited over a long period. Again, Brahmin, 
when one dwells with a mind obsessed by sloth and torpor, overwhelmed by sloth and torpor, and one does not understand as it really is. The escape from the arising sloth and torpor. On that occasion, one neither knows nor sees as it really is. One's own good or the good of others or the good of both. Then, even those hymns that have been recited over a long period do not recur to the mind, let alone those that have not been recited. Here, the third sin, third hindrance, that is sloth and torpor. When the mind is being occupied with sloth and torpor, then one does not know the escape, that is, to let go of it. They are unable to get out of that sloth and torpor when they are in it. But once there is mindfulness, they can. When they are in, when the state of mind is in sloth and torpor, then he cannot know what is good for his own self or good for others and what is going good for the both. In that case, he will not remember that has been what has been recited over a long period, let alone those that have not been recited. Suppose, Brahmin, there is a bowl of water covered over with, a, with water plants and algae. If a man with good sight were to examine his own facial reflection in it, he would neither know nor see it as it really is. So too, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind obsessed by sloth and torpor, overwhelmed by sloth and torpor, and one does not understand as it really is, the escape from the arising sloth and torpor. On that occasion, even those hymns that have been recited over a long period do not recur to the mind, let alone those that have not been recited. So here the simile is given for the sloth and torpor as the bowl of water that has water plants and algae. When one man looks at his reflection in that bowl, he cannot see it clearly. And he cannot know what is good for himself, good for others. And because his mind has been like obsessed with this sloth and torpor, he cannot remember what is has been recited over a long period. Again, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind obsessed by restlessness and remorse, overwhelmed by restlessness and remorse, and one does not understand as it really is, the escape from the arising restlessness and remorse. On that occasion, one neither knows nor sees as it really is, one's own good or the good of others or the good of both. Then even those hymns that have been recited over a long period do not recur to the mind, let alone those that have not been recited. So this is the fourth hindrance that uh, we normally experience. It's not like fourth, one along among the type of hindrances. This is restlessness and remorse. So when the mind is being occupied with restlessness and remorse, then one cannot understand the escape from it. And he does not know what is good for himself, what's good for others, and what is good for both. And he cannot remember the hymns, the spiritual chantings or the poems that we recited over a long time. And like, he cannot remember what has been recited over a long time. Then how can he remember those that have not been recited? Suppose, Brahmin, there is a bowl of water stirred by the wind, rippling, swirling, churned into wavelets. If a man with a good sight 
were to examine his own facial reflection in it. He would neither know nor see it as it really is. So too, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind obsessed by restlessness and remorse, overwhelmed by restlessness and remorse, and one does not understand as it really is, the escape from the arisen restlessness and remorse. On that occasion, even those hymns that have been recited over a long period does not recur to the mind, let alone those that have not been recited. So here the simile for the restlessness and remorse is a bowl of water that is being stirred up by the wind or maybe churn and making wavelets. Then when a person looks at his own reflection in that bowl of water, he will not be able to see because the water is swelling and there are waves that have been formed. Then he cannot know there is an escape from it. And his mind is obsessed. And because of that, he cannot recollect what's good, what's bad. And uh, he cannot remember what has been recited over a period. Again, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind obsessed by doubt, overwhelmed by doubt, and one does not understand as it really is, the escape from the arise and doubt. On that occasion, one neither knows nor sees as it really is one's own good or the good of others, or the good of God. Then, even those hymns that have been recited over a long period do not recur to the mind, let alone those that have not been recited. So, this is the fifth kind of hindrance. So, when one's mind is occupied by doubt, then there is no understanding of what is good for himself, what is good for others. And there is no mindfulness that is being established because the mind is involved so much into the doubt. So he cannot remember what has been recited over a long period. Suppose, Brahmin, there is a bowl of water that is turbid unsettled, muddy, placed in the dark, if a man with a good sight were to examine his own facial reflection in it, he would neither know nor see it as it really is. So too, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind obsessed by doubt, overwhelmed by doubt, and one does not understand as it really is, the escape from the arise and doubt. On that occasion, even those hymns that have been recited over a long period do not trigger to the mind, let alone those that have not been recited. So for the mind obsessed with doubt, Buddha has been given a simile with a bowl that is full of water and is turbid. Then when and placed in dark, then one cannot see the, his own reflection. Here we can see the own facial reflection. It's not really this face that we are looking outside, but it's the inner mind that we are reflecting. Then he cannot know what is good for himself, what is good for others, what's good for both of them. And then he cannot recollect the hymns that were being recited over a long period, let alone those that have not been recited. This Brahmin is the cause and reason why even those hymns that have been recited over a long period do not trigger to the mind, let alone those that have not been recited. So this is the reason why one cannot remember because the mind is being obsessed with these five kinds of hindrances. That is sensual desire, ill will, 
sloth and torpor, restlessness, remorse, and doubt. When the mind is involved in these kind of hindrances, we know we need to do six hours as soon as we remember. But uh, when we cannot remember, we did not perform six hours, and the mind is involved and obsessed with these hindrances, then we cannot remember. But when the mindfulness has triggered, then we can six hour it and come back. Why the hymns recur to the mind? Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind that is not obsessed by sensual lust, not overwhelmed by sensual lust, and one understands as it really is, the escape from the sensual, the arising sensual lust, on that occasion, one knows and sees as it really is, one's own good and the good of others and the good of both. Then, even those hymns that have not been recited over a long period recur to the mind, let alone those that have been recited. So we can see, when one dwells with a mind that is not obsessed, when there is no sensual desire, then and the mind is not overwhelmed by the sensual desire, then one understand as it really is. This is the as it really is, seeing things as it really is. Yatta buddha jnana darsana. There is the escape from it, like seeing things as it really is. Then there is mindfulness is established. On that occasion, one knows and sees as it really is. What's one's own good and the good of others and the good of both. This is following the Noble Eightfold Path, not harming anybody, following, treating everybody in gentle way. Then, even those hymns that have not been recited over a long period recur to the mind. Then we will understand, okay, now the mind is in this place where there is contact happening, where we are acting with craving, where the feeling is, which state of mind is going on. This we can remember it easily. Suppose, Brahmin, there, there is a bowl of water not mixed with lac, turmeric, blue dye or crimson dye. If a man with good sight were to examine his own facial reflection in it, he would know and see as it really is. So too, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind that is not obsessed by sensual lust, not overwhelmed by sensual lust, and one understands as it really is, the escape from the arising sensual lust, on that occasion, even those hymns that have not been recited over a long period recur to the mind, let alone those that have not that have been recited. So here we can see it's the opposite similes that have been given here. When the mind is obsessed with sensual lust, then a bowel is mixed with lac, turmeric, or a crimson dye or a blue dye. Then one cannot see their reflection. But the what when the bowel of water has not mixed with all these three, like turmeric blue dye or crimson, then one can, when one has a good sight and examines their own facial reflection, then he can see what is really the state of mind is. If it is obsessed with, if it is not obsessed with sensual desire, then he knows that it is not obsessed with sensual desire. And he knows that it is good for himself, it is good for others, and it is good for both. On that occasion, then in that case, he can recollect the hymns that have been not recited over a period, let alone those that have been recited. Again, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind that is not obsessed by ill will, not overwhelmed by ill will, and one understands as it really is, the escape from the arising ill will. On that occasion, one knows and sees 
as it really is. One's own good and the good of others and the good of both. Then even those hymns that have not been recited over a long period occur to the mind, let alone those that have been recited. So this is the case where the mind is not obsessed by ill will. Then he understands that the mind is not obsessed by ill will. And he knows that it's good for himself, it's good for others, and it's good for both. Then in that case, he can re remember or recollect the hymns that have been not recited over a long period, let alone those that have been recited. Suppose, Brahmin, there is a bowl of water, not heated over a fire, not bubbling, not boiling. If a man with good sight to examine his own facial reflection in it. He would know and see it as it really is. So too, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind that is not obsessed by ill will, not overwhelmed by ill will, and one understands as it really is, they escape from the arisen ill will. On that occasion, one, 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 on that occasion, even those hymns that have not been recited over a long period recur to the mind, let alone those that have been recited. So here this is the simile where the bowl of water, which is not boiling, then if a man with a good eyesight examines his own reflection, then he could see it as it really is, like knows what the state of mind is, that he, there is no ill will in present in the mind. Then, when he sees things, the reflection as it really is, then the, the mind is not obsessed with ill will. In that case, he can recollect what has not been recited, let alone those that have been recited. Again, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind that is not obsessed by sloth and torpor, not overwhelmed by sloth and torpor, and one understands as it really is, the escape from the arisen sloth and torpor, on that occasion, one knows and sees as it really is, one's own good and the good of others and the good of both. Then even those hymns that have not been recited over a long period, recur to the mind, let alone those that have been recited. So this is the third type of hindrance that we can experience. That is the sloth and torpor. When one's mind, when one's mind is not obsessed with sloth and torpor, then he can know and see as it really is, like have having established mindfulness, knowing that the mind is free from sloth and torpor and knowing that it's good for himself, it's good for others and it's good for both. Then he can remember those times that have been not recited over a long period, like alone those that have been recited. Suppose Brahmin, there is a bowl of water not covered over with water plants and algae. If a man with good sight were to examine his own facial reflection in it, he would know and see it as it really is. So too, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind that is not obsessed by sloth and torpor, not overwhelmed by sloth and torpor, And one understands as it really is. The escape from arisen sloth and torpor. On that occasion, one knows and sees as it really is. One's own good. On that occasion, 
even those hymns that have not been recited over a long period recur to the mind let alone those that have been recited so when the mind is obsessed with sloth and not obsessed with sloth and torpor and having established mindfulness here the buddha has given the simile of a bowl of water with not covered with water plants and algae then when a person with a good sight when he sees his own reflection he sees exactly what the state of mind is and he knows that the mind is not obsessed with sloth and torpor then on that occasion he can recollect what has not been recited over a period and let alone those that have not been recited let alone those that have been recited again brahmi when one dwells with a mind that is not obsessed by restlessness and remorse not overwhelmed by restlessness and remorse one understands as it really is the escape from the arising restlessness and remorse on that occasion one knows and sees as it really is one's own good and the good of others and the good of both then even those hymns that have not been recited over a pe- long period recur to the mind let alone those that have been recited so when the mind is occupied with restlessness then one cannot know what is good for themselves what is good for others there is no mindfulness suppose brahmin there is a bowl of water not stirred by the wind without ripples without spills not churned into wavelets if a man with a good sight were to examine his own facial reflection in it he would know and see it as it really is so to brahmi when one dwells with a mind that is not obsessed by restlessness and remorse not overwhelmed by restlessness and remorse and one understands as it really is the escape from the arising restlessness and remorse on that occasion even those hymns that have not been recited over a long period recur to the mind let alone those that have been recited so what happens when there is a bowl of water and one cannot uh that is not stirred up by the wind and there is there are no ripples and there is no spills or there are no wavelets then the person with good sight can see his own reflection in it and know what's the state of his mind understanding that there is no restless and restlessness and remorse in the mind knowing this that the mind is not obsessed with the restlessness and remorse he can the mind can recur what has not been recited over a period of time let alone those that have been recited again brahmi when one dwells with a mind that is not obsessed by doubt not overwhelmed by doubt and one understands as it really is the escape from arising doubt on that occasion one knows and sees as it really is one's own good and the good of others and the good of both then even those hymns that have not been recited over a long period recur to the mind let alone those that have been recited this is the fifth type of hindrance that that is doubt when one mind is not obsessed with doubt then he can know what's good for himself what's good for others and what's good for both and when the mind is not obsessed then he can recollect what has been recited over a period easy 
what has not been recited over a period and he can remember the recited ones easily. Suppose, Brahmin, there is a bowl of water that is clear, serene, limpid, set out in the light. If a man with good sight were to examine his own facial reflection in it, he would know and see as it really is. So too, Brahmin, when one dwells with a mind that is not obsessed by doubt, not overwhelmed by doubt. And one understands as it really is the escape from the arising doubt. On that occasion, even those hymns that have not been recited over a long period Recur to the mind, let alone those that have been recited. So here the simile is the bowl of water that is clear, serene, limpid, set out in the light. Then a man with a clear eyes, clear vision can see his own facial reflection in it. The understanding that there is no doubt present in him. He knows that there is no doubt present in him. Then on that occasion, he can recollect, he can remember the hymns that have not been recited over a period. This Brahmin is the cause and reason why even those hymns that have not been recited over a long period recur to the mind, let alone those that have been recited. So, this is the reason when the mind is not occupied with any of these five hindrances, then one can, one's mind can recur the hymns that have not been recited over a period easily. These seven factors of enlightenment Brahmin are non-obstructions, non-hindrances, non-corruptions of the mind. When developed and cultivated, they lead to the realization of the truths of true knowledge and liberation. What seven? The enlightenment factor of mindfulness is a non-obstruction. Non-hindrance, non-corruptions of the mind. The enlightenment factor of equanimity is a non-obstruction. The seven, the enlightenment factor of mindfulness the enlightenment factor of investigation is non-obstruction. The enlightenment factor of mindfulness. I'm just recollecting. My mind is so much into hindrances now. Mindfulness, investigation, and then the enlightenment factor of energy is non-obstruction. And the mindful enlightenment factor of mindful enlightenment factor of mindfulness, energy, mindfulness, investigation, energy, and uh, make, can you recollect my mind is maybe I have not done enough homework. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, same here. I have the same problem. So I googled. Uh, so the seven factors are uh, mindfulness, sati, then keen investigation of the Dhamma, Dhamma Vichaya, uh, energy, virya, uh, rapture, uh, rapture is not a good translation, happiness, uh, piti, uh, calm, pasadi, uh, and then samadhi, collectedness, and the equanimity. Yeah, equanimity. Upeka. The enlightenment factor of mindfulness is non obstruction. The enlightenment factor of energy is a non obstruction. The enlightenment factor of energy is non obstruction. The enlightenment factor of joy is non obstruction. The enlightenment factor of
Pasadi. Pasadi. Calm. Is non obstruction and the enlightenment. The enlightenment factor of collectedness is a non obstruction and the enlightenment factor of equanimity is a non obstruction, non hindrance, non corruptions of the mind. When developed and cultivated, they lead to the realization of the fruit of true knowledge and liberation. When this was said, the map. The Brahmin Sangharava said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gautama, Magnificent Master Gautama, from today, let Master Gautama remember me as the lay follower who has gone forth for refuge for life. So when the mind is not in these hindrances and when we are cultivating the seven factors of enlightenment, which are non-obstructions, which are non-hindrance, which are non-corruptions of the mind, then, then we are cultivating the path to the realization of liberation, that is Nipana. Uh, I like this sutta when I first heard it because it gives us state of mind that we are in, like, if the mind is in ill will, then immediately, okay, now the mind is having boiling water or maybe it's died. Maybe the state of mind is now having waves pattern or maybe it's not, it blurred the vision. It's having doubt. It's having no clarity of seeing things as it is. It gives a, a outer picture for us to see, like reflect, how the state of mind is, if it's obsessed, if it's in hindrance, we can see, we cannot see the reflection clearly. But when we know that, okay, now the mind has been occupied, then we can do six hours easily. And there is always four noble truths covering in all, any of the suttas. Some, mostly all the suttas have the four noble truths. And here, when I was reading the sutta, I was looking for the same thing. And when one dwells with a mind obsessed by sensual lust or sensual desire or any of the hindrances, then this is the suffering. Then when does not know as it really is, we escape from the arisen sensual lust when he cannot recognize. But when he can recognize the origin, when we come to this part, when one understands as it really is, the escape from the arising sensual lust, sensual desire. This is the, okay, now there is suffering present, then we know the origin, that the sensual desire is the cause of suffering. Then one knows that there is the cessation of it, that it has not been there, but uh, it was there, now it's gone. When the six are it when we see the reflection that it's clear now, then there is this cessation of suffering that is happening. And the escape from the arisen sensual lust or sensual desire, this escape is the noble eightfold path. This is the fourth noble truth. And this is what I would like to read today. Anybody has any question or any reflection or want to share anything from their own practice or how their practice is going? Nobody has a question? Okay. May you have a question? Yes. Yeah, I have a question just out of curiosity. So here, um, the Buddha mentioned the direct correlation with the hindrances and the ability to um, uh, remember 
hymns or spiritual poems. I wonder if it um, also applies to uh, our capacity to learn. Um, so to learn anything, really, you know, I, I can't help but wonder if, because a, a lot of the, the more, the more we look into the text, if we really look at how the Buddha used um, um, repetition uh, and, and um, the oral tradition, um, so obviously he he discovered something about how the brain and the mind works. So every every time I'm reading the sutta, I, I can't help but think from a, a scientific point of view whether you know. Um, um, so I'm I'm just thinking because I I teach uh, kids music right, and um, mm, it's. It's not that the kids are not intelligent, but because there is so much um, more exposure to media and television and, and YouTube and internet, etc., I myself included, I find that the, the kids have an sh even shorter attention span now. And the, the mind is um, uh, not all, but some. Um, especially the older ones, so approaching mm, teenage, um, the tendency of the mind to go dull uh, is qu quite clear. So not not only that they have a shorter attention span, or cannot really absorb, um, and and it's not only during the music lesson, at school as well. So it, it's it's a habit of the you know. And the, the 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 trouble also is in schools. Um, I remember Dr. Madhusudan said that in in India things are changing now. But for the kids that I teach, there is no habit of asking questions in the classroom. So on the one hand, there's no habit of asking questions. On the other hand, they don't even know what to ask because the the mind has gone to a, a, a dull like state, not sharp anymore. And I can see that because when I'm teaching them, they they zone out within 30 seconds. Some of them, not all of them. Yeah. Truly, my even in my experience, when the mindfulness is right, uh wherever things we keep, or if there is some activity that I'm doing. If there is something that's important, I have placed it somewhere. If the mindfulness is right, if the mind is not gone into any hindrance, then I can remember it clearly. Anytime you ask me, even if you wake me up and ask where these things are, then the mind will straightly recur. Like it will point out exactly where it was left. So it's not only to the hymns or I think it applies to like every, anything that's even to the Dhamma talks, even to in the work that we are doing, even at our office. If the mindfulness is established, knowing that the mind is not having hindrances, if it's having a hindrance, then we six are it and we come back to what we are doing. Then it's get easier. It makes our practice more harmonious. It like helps our lifestyle. We can remember things easily. We can like practice the six hours. And mostly it helps our mind to be collected on one point, as you said, Ne. Because nowadays, even when I start using social media, maybe there when you see YouTube shots or what's happening is, okay, now for one point, at least for 30, 40 seconds, your mind has one other concept. But when you scroll, there's another concept. What happening in this process is we are training our mind to not rest even for 30 seconds in any of that object. So this is the reason. Because of that, most of the people in this 
like generations modern world cannot like make their mind be collected or rested in one particular place and we are fortunate enough that we are practicing meditation and even if i scroll okay now i have done enough my mind will say okay you have scrolled three or four now you are going deep into it you will not have mindfulness enough and it just grabs our mind into it it's like a trap your mind just gets hijacked we do it and when you come out of it and when you come into come back to the present moment mind just can feel the difference it's completely different because it's like getting absorbed into that part and when you come back mind experiences relief again it's just okay now it's enough we just let go of it and come back to the present reality seeing that okay if there is hindrance if the mind goes into the thoughts we keep on practicing those six hours and i personally feel this mindfulness the practice of six hours and it's very much practical in all the aspects like the eightfold path is so wonderful when practiced together with the six hours with the right effort right livelihood keeping the precepts practicing meditation and it's not only really limited to the sitting meditation rather it's all time practice and the way bante gave life is meditation and meditation is life book it for the first time when i like read uh, heard the phrase life is meditation meditation is life okay how can this person say that life is meditation but when i was practicing before not even started the practice very well then i said okay but meditation is something different and life is completely different but when bante talks you see inspire like life is supposed to be fun and meditation is also fun there is a part where you feel happiness where you feel love when you can share so much of unconditioned happiness to all the beings that's the part where meditation becomes part of life and life becomes part of meditation it's like imbued together mm thank you sadhu 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 thank you sundar ji thank you i would i would like to add something yes actually yes. yesterday actually yesterday was uh, the day to uh, that the pali festival started in india so yesterday evening i came from office and light some dias in front of buddha's statue at that moment i don't know how and what happened to me at that moment i automatically reciting the buddha's nine qualities of buddha buddha gun and after that that uh, finish uh, that finishes and after that i started to dhamma dhamma recited and the, after that i recited to the sangha so that thing is happened to me and i connected to with this sutta particular sutta that really is that when mindfulness is correct uh, going on a smooth way that uh, moment we really recite automatically the things are coming in mind that thing thanks thanks for reciting thanks for sharing this with me thank you madam ji and this is like exact example that we are going through this sukta and it's a good reflection that you have shared thank you for sharing and uh, even at home when i recite this uh, buddha uh, buddha vandana dhamma vandana and sangha vandana even my daughter even if she did not like understand the actual meaning but she smiles because she, that has that energy that the truth of the dhamma is it will make the recitation all this mm-hmm. process so much happy and so even in the surroundings the, everybody's minds get uplifted okay anybody else want to add anything maybe share their experience if not we can share the merits may suffering once be suffering free and fear stuck fearless be 
May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all the beings share this merit that we have thus acquired with the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings, inhabitants, space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share in this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sindhu. Mm -hmm.